Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for um, joining us on the Senior Wednesday program. This is the first time I've done this, but um, I'm pretty excited about it. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about me, I, uh, as I said in my bio, I grew up in Dodge City, Kansas, and uh, I started studying uh, journalism in high school. Uh, I had a really good journalism professor there named Phyllis Whiff. And she was one of those journalism professors who wasn't just, you know, the English teacher stuck in there to babysit the newspaper staff. She was um, a former journalist who had owned newspapers. And uh, she took me, who liked to write, and taught me uh, very shocking. And um, Mrs. Whiff, of course, inst uh, instructed me that, hold on, let me make sure my internet's still working here. Uh, I'm not frozen, I hope. She instructed me that um, I needed to write about this. And so I interviewed the school board. I interviewed um, the police. You know, I was very nervous about it. Um, but I wrote a story about uh, Mr. Fox's misfortune. And um, anyway, I won all kinds of awards for that story. And it was covered in the national, in the not national press, but in the state press that this high school wrote about the story. And I got a scholarship to KU. I won the high school journal of the year award that year. And so I was off and running um, thanks to all of that kind of crazy stuff. That's kind of how my journalism career got started in high school. And so honestly, I never considered doing anything else for a career. I like to write. Um, at the time, I didn't really like to interview people. I was shy back then, which makes me laugh because I'm the opposite of shy now, as my mortified teenage daughter will tell you. Uh, I'll say anything to anyone, which she doesn't really care for. But um, oops, hold on a second. I think I lost you guys. Maybe not. Okay. Oh, oh, Zoom is so hard. Okay, I think I'm still good. Yes. Um, but anyway, uh, so I went to KU and I studied uh, journalism. I got a degree there in 1995. And um, my first year out of college, I got a job t uh, writing education stories at the Chattanooga Times in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I'd never been... Uh, you know, that far away from home by myself. And so I, it was interesting to move to a new town and, and take a new job with people, I, you know, in a strange city, but it was a really good learning experience. And then when it was time to move on, uh, I got a job offer uh, in Wichita and I did not want to go to Wichita. I did, I thought Wichita was a scary, dangerous place where people got shot on the street corners. Cause that's what we, that's what we thought in Dodge City. Of course, when I got to Wichita, I realized Dodge City was really more like that than Wichita was. And um, I ended up staying here. I got married. I had kids. And uh, in 2000, the, my editors, I, I came here to write feature stories, but near 2000, they switched the go section, um, which was the feature section, to a uh, tab format. And uh, that's instead of the broadsheet, it was the tab. And at the time, we weren't covering restaurants anymore. Diane Lewis had done it for a while. My good friend, uh, Lori Lindenberger, had done it for a while. Um, but they hadn't done it for a while. Lori was the editor then. So uh, they asked me if I'd be interested in writing about restaurants. And uh, I like to eat. Thanks to Diane and Fran Kentling, I had started to like to cook. And so I was like, yeah, I'll give it a try. And so my very first restaurant review was published in October of 2000. And I covered Scott Redler's restaurant Sea Bass, which was over where um, the Twin Peaks East is now, kind of at 21st and Rock. And uh, it was a very short-lived seafood restaurant, as most seafood restaurants besides Red Lobster here are. And um, I was off and running. And so I wrote restaurant reviews for years. And then I started covering the restaurant scene. And I've spent 20 years just immersed, or 20, I guess now we're going on, if it's 2021, we're going on 21 years just immersed in the restaurant scene, getting to know all of the people who make our restaurant scene tick, which is very interesting people, as I'm sure you know, um, if you guys dine out here. I mean, our city is so interesting because, you know, we have a lot of chains, yes, um, but we also have a lot of Lebanese food, which many, not many towns our size have the kind of Mediterranean Greek Lebanese food selection that we have because of the Lebanese immigrant population in town. Um, so we know in Wichita, we know a lot more about hummus and tabbouleh and shawarma and fatouche salad than people, you know, in cities twice our size. So we've got that going for us. We have really good Vietnamese food. We have a very active Vietnamese uh, cooking 
um, restaurant scene. If you haven't tried that, I highly recommend it. We have a lot of you know chefs who have relocated here from big cities. So I, I mean, I like the Wichita restaurant scene and I like covering it. One of the reasons is because we're a big town, but we're kind of a small town. And unlike a big city like Kansas City, even though we have hundreds of restaurants, I feel like in Wichita, I can kind of wrap my arms around them. I kind of know what's out there, what's open, what's closed. Uh, in a huge city, I don't know how you'd be able to follow that, but our city's just big enough to have variety, but small enough that I can keep track of it. Um, and so I've mostly done that. I also cover other types of things like feature, um, feature stories, stories about entertainment, um, when concerts were happening, I would cover concerts. Uh, maybe I will again someday. Um, but as I've written over the years, um, one of the things that I have always been able to tell based on, we can see how many people are reading the things that we're posting uh, and writing on the internet, which we've been able to do now for seven or eight years. And one of the most popular stories that I always write are stories about nostalgia. Stories about restaurants that aren't around anymore, that operated in Wichita long before I moved here, um, and that people still remember fondly. And anytime I would write a story about this topic, it, the story would go crazy. I think the first one I did, I wrote a story asking people something like, um, what's the number, if you could bring back any restaurant from the past, which restaurants would you bring back? And I got a huge response. People uh, wrote me emails by the dozens, uh, hundreds. Um, and I did that a couple times over the years. And then um, in the year 2016, I think it was, I'm looking at this over here on my other screen, I wrote this story that I spent um, a very long time up in the Wichita Eagles archives. And um, I wanted to show you guys a little snippet from our archives. Uh, when I started researching my book, I went up to the Eagles clip files and I grabbed all these little brown folders. And this is how the librarians in the I think it's probably from like the 50s on through the uh, 80s kept all the old articles and they would write the date on them and um, put them in these little envelopes by topic. So this is the uh, folder on Elizabeth's restaurant, which is in my book. And so every article that we wrote about them for a 25 year period, this little folder. And so I spent uh, in 2016, I spent a couple of weeks up in those archives. I got sick from all the dust that went in my lungs going through the city directories. And I came up with a list of what I believe were the 10 oldest still operating um, restaurants in Wichita. And it was pretty interesting and people went crazy for it. And of course it turned out that I was wrong on a couple. Uh, so I had to go back and do a, a part two where I added some. But among them, by the way, were Livingston's Diner, still operating. At the time it was 106. Um, and I let, it, I let it count even if they'd moved and um, change locations. New Way, I'm sure that doesn't surprise you. Old Mill, Merle's Place, that one surprised me. Um, the Beacon, Savoots, Dog and Shake. Uh, what are my other ones? Sport Burger, El Patio, Calvin's. And, um, I had to other, add some others like Ties, Club Billiards. But that story was so popular. And I was able to find some old stories with the help of the Historical Society and the Historical Museum and the Eagle Archives. Um, and so after that, you know, I don't know what it is. I, I know a lot of people, a lot of us are like this. Um, I am just obsessed with Wichita history. Not like, I mean, not so much like, you know, who founded the city and, you know, the, the Chisholm Trail stuff. What I'm fascinated by is what were the buildings that used to be in the places that I now frequent? What was life like back then? I live in Delano in a hundred and my house was built in 1908. So it's very old. And I'm just totally fascinated by the people that came before us, the people that lived here before us. How did they live? What kind of Wichita did they um, enjoy? And there's nothing I love more than finding old pictures of Wichita in of places I recognize, you know, and, and for example, I live just down the street from the Masonic home. And uh, the first time I saw a picture of the original Masonic home, which was this grand building built in limestone, um, nothing like what it looks like now. Uh, it was consumed by a fire, I believe, but it was just fascinating to me. And so I've kind of been semi-obsessed with that topic. And I 
am a member, as I'm sure some of you are, of the two amazing Facebook groups in Wichita, the best ones in my opinion. Wichita History from My Perspective is a Facebook group you can join if you haven't. And it's all Wichita's, you know, there are quite a few Wichitans who are super into local history and they know everything and they can find the answer to anything. Um, one of them, Mike Maxton is one of them. Um, there's several people on there who, if you ask a question about Wichita history, they can find you the answer in no time flat. Nostalgia page and where people talk about what they remember from their childhoods in Wichita. And uh, I don't actually know that much about that stuff because I was in Dodge City in Tennessee until 1997. But uh, I did drive through Wichita on my way to my grandparents' house in Missouri several times. And so I, I remember, um, just double checking my internet connection here. I remember um, driving down Kellogg. Hold on a second. I got to fix my internet here. Hopefully, I, I, hopefully I'm still working. I can see somebody moving. So hopefully you guys can still hear me. But I remember driving down um, Kellogg when it was, you know, still the two-lane highway. We had to stop at every stoplight, which I loved because I lived in Dodge City where there was one radio station. And when I got to Wichita, I could tune my Walkman up and down the dial for an hour listening to all the different radio stations because I was in the big city. But um, but anyway, uh, although I'm not, I don't know a lot about nostalgia, these people are filled with nostalgia. They talk about all these great things that I vaguely remember, like Barnacle Bill's Fantasy, which I've also written a story about, um, you know, all the old parks and entertainment venues that used to be here. And so I'm fascinated by that stuff too. And um, one of the number one topics discussed on that page is old restaurants that people remember. Every now and then somebody will get a nostalgic uh, bone in their body and they'll post something about um, who remembers going to Sandy's drive-in. And two days later, there's, you know, 700 likes and, you know, 16 or 250 comments and, and just everybody's joining in. So obviously this is a topic that people in this town love and I am one of them. And so um, I just enjoyed writing restaurant stories about it. But then about, I would say it was about a year and a half ago, I got an email from these people at the History Press. This is a, a group called Acadia, Arcadia Publishing, and they do history press books. And um, they have done books like, uh, I don't know if you all know my old colleague, Joe Stump, but he wrote a book a couple of years ago called Wicked Wichita. And this is the same group that does it. They're little paperback books and they have a lot of photos in them. You can see them, they have them at Watermark, they have them um, in, they have them at Barnes and Noble. I mean, you could sometimes find them in Walgreens. This is the, the operation, they do lots of these books. But they asked me if I would write a story about Wichita restaurant history. And uh, I, got, I got my editors to agree to it. And you know, I was kind of stuck for a while, not exactly sure what to do exactly how to approach it, because obviously that's a big topic here in this town. Um, so eventually, uh, after much procrastination, I decided that the approach I wanted to take was to write a story that kind of gave a history of the restaurants that people have told me over the years that they miss the most that aren't around anymore. The places that are living only in our memories. So I set, it, I set out to focus the book on that. And so the bulk of my book, which is called Classic Restaurants of Wichita and will be published on August 9th, I just found out, I'm so excited. Um, the bulk of my book is about um, restaurants that are gone, that don't exist except in our memories. Um, and I started, I do have also have a chapter at the end about the old restaurants that are still functioning because obviously you can't write this book and not include New Way and Old Mill. They're still open. They just still deserve to be included. But the bulk of them are about the places that are gone. And so the way I kind of approached it was I took a poll on that Facebook group. Uh, if you grew up in Wichita, you remember, and I think also on Wichita History from my perspective. And I said to people, if I was going to write a book about the restaurants that uh, are not around anymore, but that people miss, what would you say would have to be included? And the first thing I did was I literally sat down with a pen and paper, or actually, no, I guess I started a spreadsheet on my computer. And I, if an, a restaurant got mentioned, I typed it in. If somebody else mentioned it, I put a tally mark. And then I got myself a list of, you know, probably the 50 places that people uh, are most passionate about. And you have probably heard these names over and over again. And if you are somebody lucky enough to have grown up here, 
you've been to these places and I'm incredibly jealous of you because nothing aggravates me more than the fact that I cannot go to these places and walk into them. It's very upsetting to me. I need someone to invent a time machine. But um, I got the 50 uh, or so that, you know, people mention all the time. We're talking about places like um, Holly Cafe, um, Sandy's Drive-In, Griff's Burger Bar, um, The Big Bun, The King's X, um, Continental Grill, uh, Abe's, uh, Abe's Steakhouse, um, Ken's Club, uh, Portobello Road, Applegate's Landing. Um, uh, I can go on and on, and I did in the book. So I made a list of those, and I thought, okay, obviously, those are going to be in there. Then I started to uh, interview more people, more historians. I had a nice meeting with a man named William Sloan, who graciously loaned me a picture of the beautiful NS Tea Room to put, he's an NS Tea Room historian in town to put in the book. And he, of course, grew up here and he had about 15 other restaurants he thought I better include. And I would talk to other people and interview other people and they say, you've got to include this, you've got to include that. And so by the time I was done, when you combine all the ones that were, that were gone and the ones that are now still here, but historic, I, I did little mini profiles on about a hundred restaurants. Um, now, the thing that stresses me out a little bit is that there are going to be restaurants that people believe deserve to be in that book that aren't. And in some cases it's because I didn't know about them. In some cases, I just couldn't find anything about them. In some cases, I just had to make tough decisions because as much as I tried to persuade them, they would, they would not let me go over 40,000 words, no matter how much I told them it was important that I go higher. So I had to make some decisions on, on that. And so my answer to those people is going to be, uh, obviously I need to have a volume too. But, um, but I got a lot of them in there. And the most fun part about the process for me was, first of all, digging through the archives and I started out with the paper archives, and I don't know how many of you are really into history, but um, the best, the best, 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 best uh, resource is the website newspapers.com. And when I first started this project, there was a big hunk of Wichita papers missing from newspapers.com, especially the Eagles and Beacons. Um, you could get stuff from the 30s and 40s, 20s and 30s. You could get stuff from, you know, like. 80 forward, the, our, our digital archives for the Eagle that we, that we voice had access to is 84 forward, but there was huge chunks missing in the 50s and 60s and um, they just weren't there. And so in that case, I would have to rely on these paper clips, interviewing people. Of course, when I was almost done with the book, FYI, now all of the papers, all of the Eagles are on newspapers.com, all of them. And I think all of the beacons for all the years Thank you very much for not getting that done until I was almost done with my book. But um, that, that thing is fascinating. You can just fall down a rabbit hole on, on newspapers.com researching old stuff. And it, there's a subscription fee for that, but it's the best subscription PI, fee I pay, honestly, um, because it's such an amazing resource. But um, the other thing I would do other than spending hours and hours and hours on those clips is I spent hours and hours and hours trying to track down people who are related to the people who own these places. And that was the most fun and rewarding part. Now, one of the reasons I did it was because uh, I, they said I had to get 40 photos for this book. Well, I didn't think I was gonna be able to do that. But by the time I got to finished with it, I was so excited and I was so overzealous that I ended up with almost a hundred photos, which again, the publisher was like, what? But they said I could publish a hundred photos. But, you know, I, I wasn't sure if this, the Historical Museum was going to allow me to use their photos at the beginning. They, they weren't real sure about that. I, they eventually very graciously agreed to let me use some of their old photos, which are in there. The Eagle wasn't sure if I was going to be able to use their old photos. I also, thanks to my photo editor, worked out a deal with the Eagle that they let me use some of their old photos, but I didn't think they were going to let me at the beginning. So I needed to track down some photos I could use. And so I would use Facebook and just talking to people I knew to try to find these people and see if they had photos in their possession. And in so many cases they did. And I found these people and it was so fun. Uh, one of the first people I found was Steve Wolf, 
he's a guy who lives in town. He owns theatrical, he owned theatrical services, which rented spotlights and what have you, the theater groups. Um, and he's, you know, I think he's in his 70s or 80s now. And his father, his grandfather founded a cafeteria called Wolf's Cafeteria. Now we're all, all of us are too young to remember Wolf's Cafeteria, but it was, was um, open in the 20s, Plaza Building. It's one of the Lancers Club was in the basement. Um, Quiznos was, um, ugh, why does it keep saying my internet is unstable? Hopefully it's still working. Um, Quiznos was in, was on the corner. Now it's a, um, a Nola's pizza, but it's right there, I think at the corner of, corner of Douglas and Maine. Um, right behind that building to the south, there's a parking lot of meters that you go to and use if you're going to Century 2. Um, and then there's the library. So in between the library and that Century Plaza building at Douglas and Maine, there's a parking lot of metered spaces. Well, that's where Wolf's Cafeteria was. And I'm going to show you guys a picture of it in a minute, but it, it was this glorious, huge old building. It had this cool two-story cafeteria in it. And, Ms. and Steve Wolf had in his basement a photo album full of these photos of this place with people dining there in the 20s and 30s and 40s and uh, pictures of the outside. And it just blew my mind. And so after I interviewed Steve and I, and I got the pictures and I just drove around and around that block looking at that spot and thinking there used to be this cool restaurant there that was, it was a place where people would stand in line to get in. It was where every, everybody downtown went to eat. Um, and that just fascinated me. Uh, I found the relatives of, um, there was, there's a, and I'm gonna show you a picture from this too, but one of the very earliest um, Chinese restaurants in our Asian restaurants in our town, Chinese, was called Pan American Cafe. And it was on, um, I believe it was on North Market, kind of over across the street from where the, um, broad, uh, not Broadview, but the Lassen Hotel used to be, um, oh, I forget what they call it now. I'm not even sure what's operating there these days. Oh, I think that Caesar's table might be in there, but uh, it was right across the street from there. And it was this very popular, they called them a chop suey palace. They would make American food like, you know, steaks and, and uh, fried chicken, but they also made American, uh, Chinese food that Americans would eat, chop suey which is not a Chinese dish at all. It's just a bunch of noodles and vegetables thrown together, but we, which had several chop suey palaces and the Pan American Cafe was one of the earliest. Well, I found the, I think the great grandson or the grandson of the founder, one of the founders of Pan American Cafe, he had all these pictures and he had gone, he and his father had gone on to uh, operate other places like uh, Georgie Porgy's Pancake House over in Normandy Center. And so we spent a long time talking. I met uh, with Bill uh, Sloan, who is a, like I said, he's absolutely passionate about the Innis department store. And he knows everything there is to know about the Innis Tea Room. And he had an old photo he let me borrow. Uh, he has old menus he did not want me to borrow. Um, but just, you know, I always knew the Innis Tea Room. Bonnie Bing used to tell me about it. I always knew that it was a thing. But now I know, like, in my brain, I, can, I now know exactly where it was. I had kind of had a rough idea, but then I'm like, oh, it was on the sixth floor of the Innis department store, which is now being remodeled. But I also spent days driving around the block, staring up at that sixth floor space, and I have to go in there. I have to go in there. And I think I have found someone who's going to get me in there. I mean, obviously, it's not there anymore, but the pillars and things that used to be there, and I just need to go soak it in. Um, another example of that was... Um, I wrote about a place that opened, I think in the 50s or 60s, I'll have to look at my manuscript, but, uh, and I wrote a story about it for the Eagle. I don't know if any of you guys caught it a few weeks ago, but it was called the Lancers Club. And it started on market. And then uh, in, the, in the blizzard of 20, or no, in the blizzard of 19, I think 71 or 76, I can't remember. There was a blizzard in the early 70s. Uh, the roof of this place um, caved in. So they moved over to that same Century Plaza building I was talking about. They went to this little basement area uh, and they opened a huge Lancers Club there and they would have these um, musical acts, these Las Vegas style lounge acts from across the country. Frank Sinatra Jr. would come play on their stage um, and they would have these, you know, it was a dark basement club with these captain chair seats and um, fab fabulous stage with the sound booths and this was a place to be. It had carpet, pink carpet on the walls. You know, it was, it was a 70s nightclub heaven. And 
um, it eventually closed, but uh, they're now trying, Brett Harris from Landmark is trying to lease this space. Uh, it's open again. And so he took me down there and I just about cried because there's the stage, just like I envisioned it when I, it, it's all still there. It's like caught in a time capsule and it's ready to be something else. So if anybody has, you know, a lot of money and you want to invest in me, I think I could open a really good speakeasy down there. And I would like call it, you know, Lancers 2.0 or something. But, um, I, you know, so I got to go down there and it's just been so fun to meet and talk to all these people. I, I met the, I found on Facebook, the nephew of the man who started a, a restaurant called Casey Jones Junction, which was a, a little restaurant that had um, a train that would take food around to kids. They'd put the burger on the train and it would choo, choo, choo around the bar and the kids would grab their burgers out of the choo, choo train. Uh, they had one in the building over where Harry's is now on Douglas. And then they, he opened a West one eventually where Lee's Chinese food is now in West Kellogg. And they were train themed restaurants. They were only open for a while in the seventies, but everybody remembers going and getting their burger at the choo-choo train. And I found his nephew and he had this whole treasure trove of menus, photos, uh, some of the stuff that used to hang on the walls. And he was so happy to tell me the story about his uncle and somebody cared about the history of of this restaurant that meant so much to their family. And I'm like, yes, I care. I care about all of it. It was all so exciting to me. Um, I also tracked down every, I believe every single color postcard that features Wichita restaurants that exists on the internet. I ordered them. I own them all now. I'm looking for a little frame to put them all in and hang them in my house. Here's my collection. There, a lot of them are gonna be in my book. I've got here, um, Sidman's, uh, Brown's Grill West. Brown's Grill East, the Hickory House, uh, Sidman's West. Um, yeah, uh, I T-Bone Supper Club, although I didn't include them, I couldn't find much about them. Oh, and then I also grabbed the Masonic Home one. That's the original Masonic Home, just, just because I wanted it. But um, so just, I got so into this and for uh, probably six months or so uh, from, you know, last fall until March, it's pretty much the only thing I did. If I had a free moment after work, I, I'd, I'd finish my Eagle work and then I'd start on the book research and then I, you know, the weekend would come and that's all I do all weekend. So uh, my house and my family was very neglected for a while, but it was all worth it because even though it was a lot of work, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I want to show you guys uh, real quickly. I want to have time for some questions, but um, I want to show you a few pictures um, that, just to give you a sneak preview. Some of these things, I'm going to share my screen, I think. Share screen. Some of these things are um, photos that are going to be in the book. And some of them are things that I wasn't able to include because they either weren't good enough quality or, um, or for whatever reason, uh, I couldn't fit them, but I thought I'd show them to you guys. Now, let me see if I can get this going. I hope you guys can see that. Can you see, can people see a picture of Wicked Wichita there? Hopefully you can. I, I, yeah. I, I okay, good. I pulled we that book, I pulled that one to show you what the book's gonna kind of look like. That's Joe Stump's cover of his book. This is the same publisher. And then here's another one that somebody wrote about Harvey Houses of Kansas, which I also learned all about Harvey Houses because I mentioned them in the beginning of the book, um, which is a very fascinating thing. We had a Harvey House in Wichita down in Union Station and it sounded like it was so cool. Um, I start in the 1870s with, with the beginning of Wichita and this the historical society was nice enough to loan me this photo. One of our earliest restaurateurs who I write about was this crazy guy named Fritz Snitzler. And he owned uh, a saloon down here on Douglas and he had uh, all kinds of saloons all over town, but he was quite the character. So he's kind of one of our earliest guys and that's Fritz right there, his picture there on his saloon. Um, here's an ad that ran in the Eagle for the Pan American Cafe, which I pulled a few ads too from the paper, which I thought was so funny. Um, do you wonder what mother, do you wonder why mother asked that question so much? Breakfast, lunches, dinners, 365 days a year, and mother has to plan them all, more than a thousand meals a year. So basically they're guilting you to take mother to Pan American Cafe, because what mother wants is chop suey. I love this old stuff. That was in the Eagle, I think. Here's the picture Bill loaned me of the NST room. 
which can you just imagine eating there? I know all these columns are still there. Nothing else is there. But um, for those of you who don't know, it was on the top floor of the NST room. And ladies would wear white gloves and go have a lovely little lunch. And for a while, they had a separate men's grill where the men would go eat. And uh, it was quite the place. Uh, if you get a newspapers.com, I have some interior pictures that, you, uh, that I'm putting in the book. I just can't give them away just yet. But here's the exterior. Um, and you can see here, that's that Century Plaza building. And so right here is where the, um, the, the metered spots for Century 2 are now. Um, and so if you can kind of envision that. But look at that cool place. And it was kind of had two, it had a, a balcony and it had a giant um, dining room with a candy counter and all this stuff. And so I have a couple of pictures of the dining room in the book and oh, I love it. Uh, okay, here is the, um, the cafeteria line inside of Wolf's Cafeteria. And this is one that um, Steve Wolf loaned me to, er, for the book. And so the, this is the back of the restaurant. The front is the dining room and people would come to the back and look at these nice ladies with their crisp hats. And you'd go through the line and get some very basic American fare, but people loved it. And there were just lines and lines. Look at that ceiling. I just wish stuff still looked like this. Um, here's a copy of the cover of the Holly Cafe menu. This is one of the early um, Asian restaurants we had in town. Um, during my research, I learned that when the Pan American Cafe started, I believe there were only about 30 Chinese people living in our whole city. And almost all of them were uh, connected with these restaurants and they didn't, they couldn't bring their wives with them. They came alone and there's a whole interesting uh, story that Wayne Wong, a former restaurateur wrote about uh, Paper Sons. I, I urge you to check out his book. I, I used it for some of my research, but about um, how some of the, some of them would bring their, their children over and they'd have to have false names to get in. It was just crazy. So um, that, that was a quite an education too, to learn about all the, the Chinese immigrants to our city in the 20s, in the teens and 20s. Um, this is uh, Brown's Grill, which opened in the 40s. Now, uh, this is right across the street from Wesley, Wesley Hospital. This is what, you know, like where Chipotle and Jimmy John's are now. Used to be this cool place called Brown's. And um, any of y'all who are longtime Wichita's know, there was a guy named Charlie Brown who went on to open a place on Rock Road. This was his father. And it didn't look like this when it first opened. It was more of a 50s looking burger counter, but they tore that down and, and expanded into this. And you can kind of see, I don't, I don't think this one was built till later, but the first one opened in the 40s. But just imagine that that's what was across from Wesley. I think that's so cool. Uh, oh my gosh, there was a little taco place called Estelita's. And it was all over town and people talk about how amazing Estelita's tacos were. They were just little tiny Mexican places and they, they talk about this lady, the owner, she always had this giant bouffant hairdo and she always was apparently wearing really um, dark blue eyeshadow. Well, I found her granddaughter and I included Estelita's in the book, but I couldn't get permission to use this photo in my book uh, in time. So I didn't get to include it, but I loved this photo. So I wanted you to see it. But this, these are the founders of Estelita's. I don't know how many of you remember that. Of course, Albert's was over on um, East Kellogg. It actually lasted till about 2004, I think. And I lived here long enough to try it, but did I go there? No, because I didn't know I needed to. And I really regret that now. But um, the man who founded Albert's was named Albert. He eventually sold the son to his nephew, who was named Cornell. And he went, Albert went to California. Cornell had the restaurant for most of the time that you and I would remember it. And Cornell's still alive. And he's here in Wichita with his daughter, Glenda, who his daughter, Glenda works at the Spice Merchant. And she was so sweet. She got me on the phone with her dad. When he laughs, he sounds like Santa Claus. He's so sweet. And he had all these great memories of Albert's and he dug out a bunch of pictures for me. And so in the book, I've got some interior shots of Albert's too. Uh, this is the Fairland Cafe, which was downtown. It was kind of one of those all night, 24 hour places you could go eat. And I think it was kind of shady at some points, uh, not, it wasn't shady, but some of its characters were shady. Apparently, this is where George Polis spent most of his time eating late at night with unsavory characters. But this is one of the founder's daughters visiting that she sent this to me uh, when she was little. Uh, and then here's a here's a picture of the back entrance of Fairland Cafe. Um, and that place was open. I think uh, if I'm not mixing up my stories, I feel like the owner was about to retire and he had a heart attack the day before the last day of business. And, 
the Fairland Cafe was going, but a lot of markets, if I'm correct, I'll have to look that up again. Oh my gosh, here is another photo. I, I could not find who owned this, so I couldn't get it in the book, but oh my gosh, the Fife and Drum. This was on East Central, and this building was called the Wishbone Building because of the shape of this roof line. And it had a, it was opened uh, as a speak, as a kind of an underground bootlegging speakeasy type place. And the story goes that this window up here, there'd be a lookout that would watch to make sure the fuzz wasn't coming and warn the people downstairs who were drinking alcohol. Um, that's what it was built as. And then over the years, I had several restaurants and one of them was the Fife and Drum, um, which this couple owned and people just loved it so much. They eventually moved it to East Kellogg and it didn't last there. But another place called El La Palma operated there afterward, a Mexican restaurant. Uh, Jet Barbecue was there for a while. Then um, I think one of the Pizza Hut founders bought the property and he wanted to open a, a Papa John's there or something. And so they they were going to demolish this building and um, this preservation group convinced them to let them take it apart piece by piece. And they, they were going to reconstruct it somewhere and make it like a visitor center, but they never got it done. And so these pieces of this building are sitting in a salvage yard somewhere in Hayesville, just rotting. Makes me very sad. But um, this building, I, I just wish this was still around. It's so cool. Um, this was, uh, I found, I don't know, this must have been in the phone book or something. I loved this and I couldn't find who owned it, but I did get this picture in. Altara was over there where Scotch and Sirloin is now. Um, and it was built in the 40s. And this guy, Oligario Ayala, opened it and it had a rotating stage and organ music live while you ate your Mexican food. And it was quite the place to be. Um, here's the founders of Abe's Steakhouse. Uh, um, they were super cool people. And I, I tracked down his, uh, his son's widow who ran it until it closed. Uh, here's Abe's, which has been since torn down. It was over on 29th street. Um, I have an interior shot in the book, but this is the place that had dark walls, uh, glowing palm trees on the walls. You, it was this old supper club and it was, I did get to go to Abe's before it was gone. Um, and that was a super cool place. Uh, oh, I actually am showing you what Abe's looked like on the inside. This is one of the pictures that the former owner loaned me. And I just think that I remember that it was dimly lit. They had these glowing South Pacific scenes on the walls. I mean, that was the place to be. Uh, everybody talks about the Lazy R, uh, and I had always heard people mention the Lazy R, but I didn't know anything about it until I started my research, and I tell people it's kind of like uh, these book, these, these restaurants were like a blank coloring page in my brain from all the times people mention them, and as I did my research, it's like the colors got filled in, and I suddenly understood where they were, what they were, what they looked like, and that was just so fun for me, but this was the Lazy R restaurant. Uh, which people remember quite a bit. Oh, and here's an ad I found from a phone book for the Lazy R. Um, that's not in my book either, but thought I'd include it here. I didn't get to include this either because it's not that good of a picture, but you know, in the 50s and 60s, there were all these cool burger stands that people loved. And Sandy's was a chain, but a lot of people talked about Griff's Burger Bar and Sandy's. And a uh, lady um, gave me permission to use this book, this picture that she took a Sandy's in the 70s, but I wasn't able to include it. But I thought that was a pretty cool snapshot of what Sandy's used to look like. I think a lot of the buildings were bought by tire stores and stuff. I think maybe one or two of them are still standing, not as Sandy's, obviously. But uh, here's Casey Jones Junction, which is Harry's now. Uh, you might probably rec If you've been to Harry's on East Douglas, you might recognize the building. But that's when they built it as you can see the train details there. Gene Torline built that in the 70s uh, with the train inside and apparently the bar inside still is still there where the train tracks used to run. Of course, in my book, I, I cover all the Tubia family restaurants, um, Olive Tree, Cafe Chantilly. Cafe Chantilly was one that, that didn't last very long in the 80s, um, but everybody still remembers it. And I found this picture in the legal archives. Oh, and the pasta mill, um, which was down on, it was very, one of the very first restaurants that uh, opened in Old Town that that showed that you could have a restaurant open in the nighttime that would work in Old Town. And that was opened by Gary Streepy, who might be here with us. He said he might join us today. But Gary Streepy opened the pasta mill um, and everybody loved it. It was uh, right there where Emerson Biggins is now at Douglas and Rock Island. And uh, he loaned me this menu, which unfortunately was too big to fit in the book. But 
I spent a lot of time looking at this menu and deciding what I would have eaten had I been at the pasta mill then when it was open. Uh, it opened in the 80s. Um, and but I do have some cool pasta mill pictures that Gary loaned me in the book. And then this I didn't get to include this either, but there was a man in town, the father of the guy that owns 12. And he spent his years collecting all these old matchbooks. And I thought I might be able to use this. I wasn't, but I just think they're so cool. Look, he's, he had matchbooks from all the places. This is just a few of them. Lancers, Willie C's, Olive Tree, Chateaubriand, which I talked about, uh, Bombay Bicycle Clubs in the book. Um, I didn't get Doodah Deli or Smugglers in or the Cowboy in there. I thought about it, but I didn't. I got Steak and Ale in there. I got Tom and Sonny's in there. Got Brown's in there. Um, Gatsby's, got Gatsby's in there. So I just think that's a super fun thing to look at. Um, but that just kind of gives you a little bit of a feel for what's going to be in the book and, and the process that I took writing it. And I would love to hear your questions as long as they aren't, why didn't you include this in the book? Because as I told you, I could do probably 16 more volumes, but, um, oh, the hatch cover, that was a cool one too. But it, does anybody have any uh, questions that they want to ask or do you want to? Tell me any of those. Yeah, I'm looking through some of the, um, a lot of people have left comments oh, about, okay, yeah. about the places they remember uh, taking special trips with schools or going to restaurants on their lunch breaks. Um, I don't see yeah. any questions for, okay. per se, but I'll definitely I share all of these comments with you. I see some of them. Um, yes, Sandy's did become a Hardee's. Uh, sorry, or Hardee's took over Sandy's and that's what it became. Um, I found that out during my research. The pasta mill had live jazz on Sunday nights. Oh, I would have loved to have seen that. Silkies. I have not heard of that one. Uh, another place that I that I learned about that I thought was really interesting was a place called Bill's Le Gourmet. And it was a jazz club over, oh gosh, I gotta look it up and see where it was. I feel like it was over near Oliver or something, but there's a chef in town named Anthony Card whose father owned it. And it was a cool jazz club and some really um, historic jazz album was recorded there uh, during the time. And I just think that's so cool. Uh, Bill's on Oliver. Okay, thanks, Donna. Yes, Bill's on Oliver. This yeah, person says, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just say, it looks like some of the questions are rolling in, but you can also see those too. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah, we've got one question from Don saying, who ran Portobello Road? Was it part of Latour? No, uh, hold on a second. Uh, that's why I have my, my script here. I have <laughs> my, trans, my transcript right beside me so I could search this out. Um, it was a couple. Um, it's interesting. They, it started over on East Kellogg. And then um, they're one of the restaurants, I believe, that lost their lease because, and I can't tell you how many times I had to type this phrase in this book, Kellogg expansion. <laughs> Kellogg expansion displaced a lot of places. Yes, Larry Frasco, that's right, Donna. It opened in 1973 and, and they had to move because of Kellogg expansion. And they eventually ended up um, over uh, in downtown Wichita, uh, where like the Union... In, over in Union Station, there's the old, uh, it used to have Martini Steakhouse and it now has a Smoothie King and Poor House, but Portobello Road eventually ended up there, but it just didn't last very long. But when it was going on East Kellogg, uh, it was the thing. I mean, people loved it. And I do actually have, that I found in the old Eagle archives, an interior shot of the old Portobello Road in my book. And my, you can ask my husband and my best friend, every time I found one of these books, like I would just, or one of these photos in the Eagle Archive or Sedgwick County Archive, I would just melt into a puddle of emotion on the floor because I just like had envisioned these places and everything about them. And then like, there it is right in front of my eyes. And I just got so excited. And so, um, yeah, that, that's another, I found a Portobello Road picture. I also got so emotional when I found a hatch cover picture. This was like the coolest 80s, um, you know, kind of, hipster bar back in the day. It, it was where Quan Court used to be on Rock Road. Uh, and it was this kind of um, club that had, you know, quiche on the menu and like a brass rail that you'd lean against while you sipped your 80s cocktail. And the people would play tennis at the Rocket Club next door, which is now Genesis. And then they'd yuppie hop themselves on over and get a drink at the bar, the hatch cover, lean against the rail. 
And it just makes me think of like the Regal Beagle and all those places from Three's Company. And oh, I, and I found two pictures from inside the hatch cover and I nearly cried. Hatch cover then became Charlie Brown's Club. And then it became Quan Court. Now it's like a dentist's office, which is so boring. The old way station. Oh my gosh, yes, people. I do have the old way station in the book. And hold on, I just got to reach over here. The daughter of the owner of the old way station brought this to my house. It's an old way station um, menu. I need to get this back to her. But, oh, I'd love to have eaten at this place. Obviously, I could not get this in the book. It's enormous. But the old way station had, you know, like this lady on it. And one of the members of their family still has the stained glass from the old way station somewhere in their house. I would have loved to have seen that. Um, do I have Stocks Doc Steakhouse? Yes. I, Stocks is in the book. That was super interesting. Uh, it went through a variety of owners. And my husband, Travis, who works at the Eagle, actually went and got a picture for me. Docs has been closed, I think, since I think since 2014, but they've still got the sign outside that says garlic salad. It's still there today. If you drive by the Docs building, and garlic salad is also a topic I wrote about many times in this book um, because Abe's, um, Docs, Ken's Club, they all claim to have been in, have invented garlic salad. And recently, I dug up the garlic salad recipe that Joe Stump printed years ago. Uh, in the Eagle that was, was from the founder of the Ken's Club's daughter. And it was, I, I was shocked. It was actually quite good. To me, garlic salad sounds kind of gross, uh, but it's actually made with garlic powder and not actually garlic. So it's not even really that garlicky, but it's really delicious. Um, I have Dr. Redbird's, yes. I spent a very long afternoon in Marnie, uh, why can I never say her name? Uh, Rich Valet, Valet. Marnie Valet's basement, and she has um, all these pictures of not only the looking glass, but of um, Dr. Redbird's. I got the Dr. Redbird's menu. Those people were very interesting. Marnie's still here, and she loves to talk about it. Um, I wish I could have gone to the looking glass. That was another place that was kind of a 70s and 80s palace, and it had this giant um, stained glass dome that Marnie and Rich had salvaged from an old church um, out of town. And they put it over the restaurant part of the looking glass. And it was really beautiful. And one of those sort of uh, things it was known for. And then when that building closed, they took that glass out and it stayed over in an advertising agency for a few years where Gretemann Group is now. But now, and I think I'm going to write a story about this soon, that piece, that dome that was over the looking glass is in Botanica. It hangs over the entrance to their kind of Chinese garden event center room. They donated it there. And so there's another piece of Wichita history, restaurant history you can go and see. Yes, I got Sidman's. I did get Sidman's in there. <laughs> Mr. Sidman was very interesting. I do want to say, um, and I'm glad to keep talking about this, but if we run out of time, um, I don't know when they're going to start taking orders for the book. Um, I tried to get that answer before today, but if any of you want to send me your email address to my Eagle email, which is D N E I L. Denise Neal, D-N-E-I-L, at wichitaeagle.com, or get me a message somehow through Facebook, whatever. I'm starting a, a list of email addresses, and when I know, I'm going to send out a message to all of y'all telling you how to get it. So if you do want to be on a list um, to be some of the first people to know about it, it's D-N-E-I-L at wichitaeagle.com. Um, I'm looking at a little, some of these comments. Kay Shibley, yes, um, Camille's. I didn't know anything about that. I've known Patrick and Timory Shibley who own Duda Diner for literally years. I had no idea that Patrick's dad was a Wichita restaurant pioneer. And that was quite shocking for me to find that out. But yes, Patrick Shibley's dad, Kay, started a, a, a nightclub called Camille's over where Sapporo is now at Kellogg and Rock. And he had several other restaurants and he sounds like he was a pretty cool guy. And and then I later realized Patrick and Timory have the original Camille's menu hanging up in Duda Diner. So it just all came together. And I, I can't, I'm sure you can imagine how much I was geeking out every single day. Oh, they asked if I can share my email in the chat. I think I can. D-N-E-I-L at Wichita Eagle.com. Denise, if, one thing I was going to ask you is um, you kind of cut out when you were talking about the two Facebook groups at the beginning. Um, oh, I did. Darn it. Yeah, will you share those with us? Yes. So that way? The two Facebook groups that everybody uh, that are the best thing to be a history geek 
the one the ones that talk about restaurants the most is if you grew up in Wichita, Kansas, then you remember. It's kind of a <laughs> clunky name for a Facebook group, but that those folks talk about restaurants nonstop. I love those people. And then the other good one that, that Mike Maxson is really uh, active in that's super interesting too is Wichita history from my perspective. And I think both of these, you just send a, a message to them saying you want to join and they'll let you in. But if you're into restaurant history or Wichita history or cool old photos or just want to know more about Wichita history, those are super fun and posts show up every day, you know, with a little something interesting about what used to happen in our town. So do I know where Nathan to be at? I just found out recently that it's not to be at, which is I always said it's to to buy it or oh gosh, now I can't remember, but <laughs> I don't know where Nathan is. The last he's the uh, son of, of Antoine who founded Latour and all those places. Um, last I heard he was was cooking in Kansas City, but I really have not heard about Nathan in years. The Petroleum Club is still around. I don't have that in the book. Uh, it is still open, but I think it's a mostly, it's just for members. It's like, it's like for people who work in the building and members. So it's not, I don't write about those. I don't write about them or the Candle Club too often because people who don't have memberships can't go to them, but it is still around. Um, <clears throat> let's see, Garlic Salad, Dr. Redbirds, yes. Stockyards Hotel, I heard about that one, but I just couldn't get it in there. I did, oh, the grape I got in there, absolutely. Um, I did get Hickory House in there. One of the ones that was fascinating to me too is there was a place called Lakeshore Club, which was over by that trailer park that was destroyed by the tornado in 99. Uh, it was a little man-made lake and it was this, it was built as this beautiful club. It had these like tiki Hawaiian rooms in it and then this little man-made sand beach and there would be water skiing demonstrations. And on opening day, they had a guy parachute out of the sky and land in that sand pit, which they called at the time Crystal Lake. And a lot of Wichitans have memories of growing up eating there, going there with their families to swim. And she's like, I had no idea. And so that was really fascinating too. Just all the things I came up that I came across were so interesting. Um, can I talk, can I talk some about Elizabeth? How much time do we have left? Four You've minutes. got about four minutes, yeah. I did some research on Elizabeth's and it was opened by a lady named Elizabeth who I think she had, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, I think she had been a home ec teacher. Um, and she had this little restaurant. It kind of had a garden theme. Um, it was very pretty. I have the postcard that's in the book. I, I did get the postcard in the book that shows what Elizabeth's looked like. Um, it was just a very dainty kind of in his tea room type place where people would go to have lunch here. I hate to hold this up, but I don't know if you guys can see that at all. It might be too reflecty, but um, she ran it for a long time. And then um, eventually she, uh, she also lost her building to Kellogg expansion and she married a man. No, she didn't. She sold it to Portobello Road. She didn't lose it to Kellogg expansion. Portobello Road did. But yeah, Portobello Road took over that building. But she eventually moved to Indianapolis because she got married to this man who made like um, ice cream molds. And then she became a really big deal in Indianapolis running this ice cream mold emporium with her husband. So the things you find out, very interesting. Yeah, that's um, really fascinating. Yeah. Yes, I do have a passion for this. Absolutely. I could talk about it for two or three more hours. Magnolia Cafe. Yes, I got that in there. Um, how old is Jax? Oh gosh, I think Jax started in, I just wrote about this a couple weeks ago. I think it was the fifties. I never heard of Silkies. Um, I should probably look that one up. Oh, like a lot of good um, comments here. Yeah, we'll be sure to share those with you. So yeah, that please do. I can't wait to read through all of these, but yeah. I hope that um, my, my goal is to uh, set up signings and things where people can come and we can talk about this. I have this dream and I haven't worked it out yet, but when, once COVID Im improves a little bit more even, I want to have an event at the Historical Museum where I'm going to try to get some of these photos framed, you know, where you can see them larger. And I want to invite some of these people that I interviewed, these, these descendants of these people to come and, and talk to people too about what they remember about their family's restaurants. Because you'd just be shocked, Tom, I don't know if you'd be shocked, but there are so many 
descendants of these folks just walking around, you know, living their lives in Wichita. They have all these memories of these places that we all cherish so much. Well, Denise, you froze, but I'm going to go ahead and um, much, but can only visit, let you know. Were you able to put your email in the chat at all? There, I got a question asking. Um, yes, I did. Okay, perfect. Am I unfrozen now? You are. <laughs> I supposedly have the best internet the, the world has to offer, and yet this is what happens. Well, we really appreciate you um, taking the time to join us today. It's been really fascinating to learn all about um, history here in Wichita and the restaurants.